A few years ago, I was hanging out with my mom and she asked me, so, mijito, what do you do? It took me by surprise. It was a bit strange that my mom, after all these years, didn't know <laughs> what the hell I do for a living. Did she just not take an interest in my things? Do you even know that I exist, mom? Do you not like me? Are you not proud of me? But then I started getting paranoid. Maybe my mom's questions were more like, what do you even do? What is so special about you? You're always on your computer. Do you do anything? And all of this thinking happened in half a second in my head. All of these fears and insecurities just came as a burst in my mind. And today I want to talk about those things, those dark thoughts that as a designer and as a creative are always present in my head. And I want to share how I'm starting to deal with them. So in a way today's talk is kind of a self-reflection and I hope it helps you in discovering and fighting your own inner demons. And yeah, but before that, let me go back to my mom. My mom, is a retired teacher. She used to be a teacher at a middle school for like seriously most of her life. And she makes the spiciest <laughs> enchiladas in the universe. Uh, for those who don't know, enchiladas are like roll tacos, smothered in hot sauce, like really hot sauce. And I'm not kidding, they, they're so hot that you feel the burn twice. Once when they come in, and again, when they come out, two for one. <laughs> so. Like I was telling you, my mom asked me, so, mijito, what do you do? Well, mom, I suppose this is a time to confess that I am a designer. Oh, see, si, designer. Well, your cousin Juanita needs invitations for her wedding. Maybe you know, mom, I don't design those kinds of things. Now I design things people use every day. Oh, so like clothes, because your cousin Juanita is still looking for a wedding dress and you know, mom, I'm not a fashion designer. I'm not that talented. <laughs> I design products. Oh, products. Wow. Well, the chair in the living room has a broken leg and no, mom, you don't understand. I don't design physical products. I design digital products. And this is where my mom got a bit confused. See, my mom didn't start using a smartphone or the interwebs until like a couple of years ago. So all of this is kind of new to her, but I knew how to explain this to her in a way that she would understand. See, we have had a Facebook account since forever, right? Well, my mom just started using it. And not only my mom, but also my grandma. In fact, they're the only people that still leave comments on my doodles. And it's always the stickers of dogs with hearts. And they show me their support. They're the sweetest, sweetest ladies. So I told her, well, I designed things like that, mom, like Facebook. And she was like, huh. Oh. I didn't know if it was confusion or just disappointment. Well, that, doesn't that already come with a telephone, mijo? No, mama, you don't get it. Someone has to design it, make decisions, use typography, color palettes, use the flows and push those pixels. Very important stuff, mom. So, and well, for my mom, those things are just stuff. It just magically appears on her hand. But she was happy with my responses. Ah, que bueno, mijo. Very good, mijito. But I started wondering, why would this bother me so much? Why was I getting all offensive with my mom? She was just curious, but somehow her question, what do you do, triggered something on me. Suddenly, I was getting defensive. I, I was trying to prove something. And I wanted my mom to know that being a designer was pretty cool. I mean, maybe because I want my mom's approval. I want her to be proud of me. But there was something else too. Her question provoked something in me, perhaps a trauma that I have as a designer, the feeling that I always have to defend what I do. Suddenly my mom's question transported me to a meeting room full of executives to whom I have to justify every little pixel on the screen. 
the managers, the clients, the non-designers who just don't understand creative thinking. They just don't get it. They, they don't appreciate the struggle of the designer and the power of imagination. They just want their logos to be bigger and everything to just pop. You know who I'm talking about. And as a designer, I always have to defend my decisions and, and fight these people who only think about numbers and can't understand creativity. Oh, I'm just so traumatized by them. But really, did I really suffer from a shock of these past experiences? Was I really traumatized? Or was I just choosing to feel that way? Could it be that I was just given a special meaning to these experiences for a personal purpose? What if I was just manufacturing this state of anxiety to achieve a goal? Could it be that instead of trying to empathize with the people I designed for, instead of listening, I had chosen to see them as an adversary? In my story, I had given them the role of my enemies, not my allies. And why? Because this fits the narrative of me being special and misunderstood because I am a creator. In my story of the misunderstood designer, I had to use the, that adversity to make me feel unique and special because it's easier to believe this myth instead of doing the work of empathizing and understanding where people are coming from. By choosing this fiction, I don't have to explain myself. I don't have to change. It's they who are wrong. Because opening up and listening means that I have to work and it makes me vulnerable. And that exposes me to their criticism and, and I could face rejection. But again, why? Where does this all come from? I think it's from a feeling of being small, of feeling inferior. As a designer and as an artist, I had chosen to believe that I'm not as accomplished like as a doctor or a lawyer, you know, like real professions. And I had embraced the idea that my work is not as valuable as others, like real artists. <laughs> but the funny thing is that I turned this feeling of weakness into the opposite. I transformed it into a feeling of superiority, kind of like a defense mechanism. Right. I was able to do a switcheroo in my head and converted that inferiority into something that made me feel above others. How, how, how did I do that? Oh, well, I, I just became a designer who bragged about how hard it is for him. Oh, nobody understands me. Oh, it's so hard to be a designer. Oh, I am a tor tormented artist. My thinking is on a different level. Oh. My craft is unique and misunderstood. Saying that to myself made me feel special. It turned me into a martyr. It, because suddenly I was the visionary, the only person in the room who could see everything so clearly. Being the victim became an advantage. It was a cozy spot. It's almost as if two little Pablos lived in my head, the one who feels superior and misunderstood, and the one who is in constant need for recognition. But where does this all come from? I believe that I developed this fear and uncertainty about my craft and art by comparing myself to others because I was measuring the value of my work against what people thought of me and their judgment. I was more eager to get the meeting room's approval than I was worried about actually solving the problem, almost as if I was in a fight or in a competition. And when you're in a competition, you're unable to value your own work unless others recognize it. You're always measuring it against others. I had stopped writing with a purpose and I started designing, designing for, for praise. And since I was always defending what I did, I started protecting it, building walls around it. I started doing, uh, being on the defensive and, and, and closing my, my work to others, saying things like, oh, what I do is too complex. You're not a designer, so you wouldn't understand. Seriously, that, that was me. Maybe I wouldn't say it out loud, but I, I would at least think it. I mean, what a jerk, right? Who, who want to work with this guy? Uh, but what could I do? How could I start feeling more confident about what I did? And how could I stop being so arrogant? Well, I guess I could just do the opposite, right? Just simple. So I could just start by not trying to fulfill others' expectations, by not seeking their recognition. 
and worrying more about the problem at hand and also my own values. But the thing is that when you do this, you also have to be okay with rejection with your work being criticized and put up for review. You have to be comfortable with opening up and becoming vulnerable. But as an artist, the idea felt so bizarre to me because doing the things that people like was kind of my job description, you know, like doing pretty things. But no, I was confused. Now as I created my need for approval, this is still there, but now it comes from me. I don't seek it from the praise of others. And now it comes from my own growth and enjoying the process. As an artist, my attention is to develop my craft and it's not about comparing my work against others. Now I only compare it against my own, my past work, so I can see my progress and I compare it to my ideal. So it keeps me motivated in moving forward on what's important, the here and now. And I'll admit, the fear doesn't go away. The fear is always there. Um, and there's still that little voice that who makes me feel small and in fear. But now I'm choosing not to define me. I'm choosing not to be the victim anymore and accept who I am. Now, it might seem like I'm saying that my solution is just to stop listening to others. Screw them all, right? <laughs> but no, as a designer, a big part of my job is also listen to people. But I had to switch from listening with self-interest to listen with a concern for them. Because when you're looking for praise or approval, you only listen in a, in a self-centered way. You're only looking for the things that benefit you. So instead of thinking, how would this person help me? I started asking, how can I help this person? For me, the answer to this question uh, was to share my knowledge. That was kind of like, oh, my calling. <laughs> to open up as an artist and designer and empower others to be designers too to give them the ability to build, create, and solve their own problems. I used to think that I was in a competition, so I would see people as my rivals or a threat, even my mom. <laughs> so I would defend my work and knowledge against their judgments and close the doors so they wouldn't have a valid argument against me because I didn't trust them. But then I realized that I'm not in a competition, that, I'm, that I can have confidence in others and I can contribute. So then my purpose in life became to bring down those barriers of design and I, that I had helped build and allow others to create, to fight the myth that only a select few are creative and that I was as part of a special club that gets it, the elite of artists and designers. And now I see that in creativity, there's abundance. And my purpose is to allow people to discover that they also have a story to tell, to help them recognize their own capacity to create. As an exercise of this, I started giving free design workshops in San Francisco. Next, I was sharing my knowledge with video courses. Yes, I became a YouTuber, as you can see. <laughs> then it became about open sourcing doodles so people could use them on their own creations. And now I'm proud to be part of a team working on allowing people to discover their creative superpowers with Blush and bring other artists that believe in this idea of abundance too. Other, other artists who also think that we can give to the world instead of expecting what the world gives to you. And I don't know, look at all the cool stuff that people create with the Blush Studios. Uh, I don't know, with this gift from other artists. Suddenly my work as a designer isn't based on others' opinions or recognitions of my work. Now it is on understanding that I'm part of a global community, just like the Figma community, <laughs> and on what I can do so others can be creative too. So more recently, when my mom asked me again, so, mijito, what do you do? I didn't get defensive, I, get, I didn't get triggered. I just told her, I tried to help others to be creative. Like I told you, my mom is a retired teacher, so she said, oh, okay, mijito, it is maestro. You're a teacher. Si, mama, I am a teacher, I am a maestro. And she was finally pleased. Here's my mom, the one person from, who, from whom I still seek her approval. Yeah, that's, uh, that's me. That's her. Uh, my hair sometimes is just too big and it's on her face. And yeah, look at that. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I would love to continue this conversation. You can follow me on all, almost all the social medias as Pablo Stanley. 
And I think also on Figma, just as Pablo. And also you can create really awesome doodles with Blush at blush.design. And that's it. Thank you. Muchas gracias.